Hello and welcome to lecture 11 for ECE 205. In this lecture we're going to continue our discussion of the linear oscillator that we derived the equations for in the last lecture. So the first thing I want you to do is to recall that the equations of motion we derived in the last class for a spring were m, where m is the mass, times y double prime, plus c, where c is a uh, constant that is related to the amount of dampening of the system, times y prime, plus k, where k is the spring constant, times y is equal to some forcing terms over here. So this could depend on time, it could be constant, that type of thing. So in the last lecture, we considered the case where c was equal to zero and f was equal to zero. So last time, that is what we did. And physical examples of something like this would be, say, a pendulum that we could draw here. Oops. Uh, so I have kind of a ball sitting here hanging by this, and this is having some slight range of motion, say, from here to here, where the ball will oscillate between here. If the top is extremely well lubricated and, say, in a vacuum type thing, then we could approximate the c to be zero. It won't exactly be zero in the real world, but in an idealized setting, you could. And here, if we just kind of picked up the uh, pendulum up to this point here and let go of it, there's no extra external forcing terms outside of gravity, which is already contained in the equation. So this is a type of scenario where you could expect this type of model with these two assumptions to roughly hold. Other examples could be something like a spring that we just have tied to something and it's oscillating back and forth, or some type of quartz crystal with no forcing terms, that type of thing. In practice, generally C will not be zero, and in most applications, F is also not going to be exactly equal to zero. So let's kind of expand our world a little bit by first examining the case where F is non-zero. Okay, so in this class where f is non-zero, we call this undamped force oscillation, uh, given that c is also still zero. Okay, so in this case, our assumption that we're making is simply going to be that c is equal to zero, and f can be something that's non-zero here. Okay, so m and k will, generally speaking, always not be zero, so it's really only f and c that we can really need to worry about here. Okay, so this is what we are considering here. So let's think about this problem here in kind of a physical framework just for a second. When would I have a undamped forced oscillation? Hmm. Okay, so just in words here, when would this physically happen? Well, one application that you can think of is, say, a swing. So say if you're on a swing or someone else is on a swing, that's basically a pendulum, which is an example of a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so say if you're pushing someone, and we have one person over here, if this person's giving the other person a push when it comes to this point, what's happening is at this point when you're pushing on them, you're imparting a force to them. So in this case, your force forcing function might look something like, this. Well, originally you give them a push for a bit of time, and then you stop pushing when they're off kind of the back edge, and then you kind of pick up and maybe push again. So you would have a forcing function that maybe would look like this as a function of time. So here you could assume this would be periodic, uh, and in general we can't really solve uh, problems with this type of forcing function yet. We will do that once we start talking about Laplace transforms, but this is one example where this could be the case. Okay, what's another example? Well, buildings, or in particular, wind pushing on a building. Okay, so here we have buildings, like say some big skyscraper. So here's my little picture of a skyscraper, just a big box that comes out of the ground, do, 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 something like this. And if the wind is blowing on this, what happens? Well, the skyscraper, generally speaking, is made out of materials where it kind of has a static fixed position. So it has a default rest position, just like the spring or the swing, where default positions being down here for that case, or the spring having a fixed length. So here, when I put some wind blowing over this, what it causes this building to do is to actually vibrate back and forth, just a little bit. 
so you can kind of notice this could be a problem if you're in the building. You really don't want things swaying back and forth. They could fall down. So in this case, you could have, say, some forcing term here that could have any type of thing. It could be, say, constant with respect to time. That's one option. It could be like kind of a sinusoidal, the wind kind of comes and goes type thing. And in general, it's going to be some more complex function. But these are kind of two options that you could potentially have here. Okay. So in general, uh, one reason why we care about these types of problems, like in particular these types of problems, is because that they're a rough model for these type of physical situations. So here, the model's a lot more complex, but if you want to understand the more complex model, you need to understand this. Okay, so now that we have some motivation for why we might want to consider a uh, undamped forced oscillation, let's actually look at some actual problems here. Okay, so let's first grab this example here out of Trench. Okay, there we go. So for this case, we want to solve this initial value problem, and before we get into this, let's just kind of briefly discuss discuss what this is really saying physically. So if you recall, the equations that we were considering before were of the form m y double prime plus k times y is equal to some forcing term, right? So here, this is not quite of this form. So what's really happening here? Well, we noticed in the previous example on the last lecture that we could divide everything through by m and instead talk about k divided by m, which actually allowed us to solve questions without knowing what k or the mass was, which was quite useful, right? So here, what I can do is if I divide everything through here uh, by m, I could call this thing k divided by m times y. This thing was going to be positive because k is positive and mass is positive. So this will just be omega naught squared, okay? So I'm really just defining this to be omega naught here. And then for this forcing term here, I'm just assuming that f is some constant times this cosine of omega uh, t. Okay. And then when I divide this side over here by m, that's where I get this thing all divided by m over here. Okay. So that's really what's happening physically is we're just assuming that we have a periodic forcing term with some amplitude f naught and some frequency omega. Okay, and as we've seen before, when I'm trying to solve linear first order difference equations of this form, uh, if I'm going to try to use my method of undetermined coefficients to solve this, I'm going to have different things happen if omega is equal to omega naught, right? If it's equal to omega naught, then I have to have that extra term of x to multiply by my cosine term to be able to actually solve that. Uh, and on the other hand, if it's not equal, then I could just simply assume that the function, the forcing function will be uh, some, or some sum of sines and cosines uh, with the frequency of omega. Okay, so here we could say something like, since omega is not equal to omega naught, what can I do? Well, we can assume that yp is equal to some arbitrary number a that I don't know yet, times cosine of omega t, plus another arbitrary term b that I don't know yet, times sine of omega t, right? So I can make this on dots with this situation here. If this wasn't true, I would need to have an x for each one of these terms here. Okay, so now what I can do is some pretty straightforward arithmetic that we've done before, so I'm just going to kind of speed through it. But basically, we take the derivatives of this y sub p, uh, plug it into here, and then try to figure out what these terms a and b need to be. So let's just chase out these details real quick here. Okay. 
now that we have this term here, if we want this to actually solve the equations, we need this thing to be equal to the forcing term here. So again, we need, and you don't have to write the need, I just kind of find it useful to make it clear that here I'm saying this is an equality that I want to be true, not an equality that is going to get, be guaranteed to be true. And I mean, it will work if you always pick the right ansatz, but in practice, at least once in your mathematical career, you're gonna pick the wrong ansatz. Okay, so we need this to be true. Okay, so this gives me a system of equations that I can solve by, again, simply setting the coefficients equal to each other. So in part, this should be a review mostly here, but uh, there is a little bit of physical meaning going on, so that's kind of what we're going to interpret out of it. But hopefully this is all review. So here, if we set these coefficients equal, I need it to be the case that this minus omega squared plus omega naught squared times a, that's the uh, term here in front of the cos term, needs to be exactly equal to this f naught over m. And at the same time, I need uh, to have the minus omega squared plus omega naught squared. This whole quantity here times b needs to be equal to zero. Okay, so from here, it's not bad at all to solve these. Uh, simply solving for a gives me a is equal to my f naught divided by this term times m. And for my b, I simply get that b is equal to zero. Okay, so from all of this, I've made my ansatz. I can put all this together and I could say something like thus. My y sub p is simply going to be equal to this thing here times my, uh, sorry, this term here, plus nothing for the sign term. So just writing that out. Okay. And if you look at this, notice something real quick. Here, if omega was equal to omega naught, this would be dividing by zero, which we could not do. So in the case where omega is equal to omega naught, this method won't work. As we already know, we need to have a x in front of the sines and cosine terms here. Okay, so now that we found a particular solution, our goal was to solve an initial value problem. So we need to have the general solution. So from here, we could simply do something like, say, note that the general solution to the complementary equation is, well, what would this be? So let's just kind of think for a second. So if I go to actually look at the uh, characteristic polynomial of this, I would simply get something that would look like, say, r squared plus omega naught is equal to zero. So this has roots being omega naught i with a plus or minus in front of it. And we know in this case, freely, that the solutions would simply be sines and cosines with this frequency here. So from here, I know that my y, I'll call it h for homogeneous, is simply going to be an arbitrary co constant times cosine of omega t plus an arbitrary constant times sine of omega t. Okay. So here, that's my homogeneous solution, thus my general solution will be, and just putting it in words as if I was doing homework, thus the general solution to the fourth problem is, well, we just add these together. So let's just do this real quick. Okay, so now that we have this, our goal ultimately was to solve this initial value problem, so we really want to apply these initial conditions. Well, that's simple enough to do. So we could say uh, applying initial condition that y of zero is equal to zero. What would this give us? Well, if I plug in zero, I'm going to get a one here, a one here, and a zero here. So from this, this would tell me that zero is going to be equal to this forcing term plus this arbitrary coefficient here. So from here, I can solve for C1, and I can say from here, C1 is just going to be this. Okay, so next up, I need to apply the second initial condition, y prime is equal, or y prime of zero is equal to zero. So applying this, if I just plug this in, so these terms will become signs, so I'm just going to ignore them entirely. 
And this term, I take its derivative, which gives me a cosine, and there I would get simply this term here. Okay, so here when I plug in zero to this, I'm just going to get one. So from here, this simply tells me that C1 or C2 has to be zero. Okay, so now I can put all of this together and write out my general solution or my particular solution to the initial value problem. So now we could leave our final solution in this form, but our goal here is to really understand what's happening with this problem. Okay, so the first thing we do is go back up here and fix this typo where I wrote omega instead of omega naught. So if I do this all throughout, uh, changes the thing here, changes this here. At this point, it formally changes this to an omega naught, but that doesn't change the final result. And then I get an omega naught there. So now that I have the correct thing there, uh, if I wanna actually understand what's happening with this, you could just throw this in a calculator and say, yep, there we go, that's a good day, and be happy with that. But in general, uh, there's a lot of problems that you can't actually throw into a calculator and like look at a solution and get everything from there. So let's break this down mathematically to try to get a better handle of what this thing does physically. So the first thing I can do is just factor out this common term out of both of these cosines. So let's do that real quick. Okay, so this is similar in form to what we had previously, and we were able to write that sum as just a single trig term, a single periodic function, right? And from a theoretical standpoint, you could kind of look here and think, hey, it's at least feasible that I could be able to write this term here in parentheses as a single trig term of like of the form r cosine of something t plus some phase factor, right? Sine or cosine there. So it turns out that this is the case and I don't wanna go through all the details and spend all the time doing that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grab from the text and just explain what the text is doing. Okay, I know it can be a little bit annoying to do this, but I'm gonna shamelessly do this here just to save you a bit of time. Okay, so here what they're really doing is kind of a fancy trick. They're noticing that if we start with two trig uh, identities of this form, we can manipulate them to be able to simplify this single term here into a single trig term. Okay, so generally speaking, one way that you could approach this is to look at a uh, identity for cosine of something t minus cosine of something else t and try to simplify it out from there. But this trick here works rather rather well in this case, so let's just see what they did. So here, if we take this cosine of alpha minus beta, we know that that's simply this, and cosine of alpha plus beta is simply this, right? That's our standard sum and difference trig identities. If you don't have this memorized, don't worry, I'm not going to fundamentally test you like, oh, you have to have this thing memorized. Uh, if I need you to use identities like this for a question on say the final or the midterm, I will give you the identities I want you to use there. Okay, so from here, the nice trick turns out uh, to happen when I subtract these two. So when I take this cosine of this term minus cosine of this term, I get something of this kind of functional form here. And the key idea of having the thing of this functional form is that this looks very similar to what we have up here, right? So if I let the alpha minus beta be omega t and alpha plus beta be omega t, then they're exactly the same, okay? So what I can do here is I can then do what I just said and let alpha minus beta be this and alpha plus beta be this. And under this uh, definition that I just put from kind of noticing that I had the similarity here, I can solve this for alpha and beta. Okay, that's a simple enough linear system to solve and I simply get alpha is this and beta is this. Okay, and then the text follows up here by substituting this all in to get the kind of simplified version of our solution. So here, if I do all the substitution, I get this cosine term here, the thing in parentheses, would simply be two times sine of this term times sine of this term. Now you might be asking like, hey, this is still a product of sine terms. It's not just one sine or one cosine. 
you said we wanted to get it as one sine or one cosine. What's the deal? Well, really what's happening here is we can interpret this solution in an interesting way. Okay, so if I go back over to here and include this term and absorb it with this two sine of this term here, I can rewrite this whole thing as r sub t times a single sine. Okay, so before in our examples, r was not a function of time because it wasn't really growing or decreasing, right? I just had these free oscillations that would oscillate back and forth forever. But now it turns out that when I do this extra step here where I add this forcing, where I have this extra little forcing term here, that causes the amplitude to increase or decrease over time. In this case, it causes the amplitude to act like this function here. Okay, so what's really happening here is that this uh, amplitude is changing over time, and this function is telling me how that amplitude is changing. Now, just kind of one word of caution here. I've been referring to r of t as the amplitude, but it technically isn't the amplitude, right? So the amplitude itself would be the maximum and minimum values of this r sub t times this uh, sine term here. And it could be the fact, and in general it probably will be the fact, that unless these frequencies match up nicely, generally speaking, this r of t will never actually be the amplitude itself in kind of the traditional sense of the word amplitude because I would precisely need to need it to be the case that this thing is at a maximum at the same point in time where this thing is at a maximum. So here it's really an amplitude function, and it tells me a lot of the information about the amplitude, but there is no kind of standard amplitude thing happening here. Okay, so a natural question that we can ask at this point is how big an amplitude could this get? So if I go back to my physical problems over here that I was discussing, uh, here this building might be able to survive oscillations up to a certain extent, but it could be the case that if the building was ever, say, at this angle here, then the whole thing falls apart and bad things happen. So we, generally speaking, want to know how big an amplitude this can be. Is it bounded? Is it not bounded? What's happening there? So what we can notice, since I have the function in this form, it's really easy to get an upper bound for the absolute value of y of t. Okay, so basically I'm going to do the same type of tricks that I've done in the Marmy Bowl problems. I say problems because there's two. You might not have done the second one at this point in time, but you will eventually. Uh, so what I can do is I can just say, hey, this thing is bounded above by what? Well, here I have this r of t times this sine thing times this other sine term here. So this will be bounded in absolute value by the absolute value of each one of those terms. But these sine terms are bounded by one, right? So what I can do is I can simply write out this. Okay, and now I can split this up pretty much directly just using the properties of absolute value, and I can split it up into these three terms here. Okay, now since these sine terms are bounded uh, above by 1, I could simply bound this by this term here. Okay, so what does this tell me? This whole thing tells me that the upper bound for the size of the absolute value of my vibrations is simply going to be given by this term here. Okay, so I don't know whether or not I'll actually reach this term exactly, but I know that will be my upper bound. So what I can now do is I can use kind of all this information together to actually get a plot of various solutions to see what's happening. Okay, so to visualize this, I'm going to use a MATLAB script that I just wrote. So here things might be a little small. Let's see if I can increase the font real quick. Okay, there we go. Hopefully this will be visible on smaller screens. If you use the lower resolution, I think it should at least. 
But if it doesn't, then the main thing is to get the plots out of here. Okay, so basically what I've done is I've defined the various terms that I have here. So I have F naught M, omega naught, and omega, which I use W instead of omega. So I can change these values. Here I have function handles that will uh, basically, for any given value of T, it computes this thing here, okay? Uh, so here technically I don't need the dot time, so if I wanna be a bit more accurate, but here I do need it because these are vectors. MATLAB thing, if you don't know it, it then it doesn't really matter. But if you have questions on how this works and why you need dots versus why you don't need dots and that type of stuff, feel free to ask me, I can talk about that. So basically here I'm defining R, which is this term over here that we defined here. I'm defining Y, which is the solution itself up here. And I'm defining this thing called U bound, which is this term here where I drop the app, well, actually I leave the absolute values here. So yeah, so I'm defining these three things. And then for time going from zero to 100 pi, arbitrarily chosen, I'm going to plot the uh, R so I can know that amplitude function in red. Then I'm going to also plot the solution in blue. And then I'm gonna plot the upper and lower bounds. So what we're going to do here is we're going to explore what happens with different parameters and things like that, just briefly. Uh, just by plotting these things for different values here. So if I run this once, I get a figure over here. Okay, so I'll make it full screen. So basically this R, this is where my upper bound was. And you can notice that the R reaches exactly this upper bound uh, in green here. And that's precisely because R is always going to hit that. But my solution itself within this case doesn't actually hit that. It gets close. If I just zoom in here, uh, this is kind of the closest it gets, but it doesn't quite reach it. And that's just because of the mix match between those omega and omega naught terms. So what do I really see going on here? Well, over time, I kind of have this oscillations where I kind of get this, well, if I just start over here, where I kind of get this increase in the amplitude followed by a decrease in the amplitude, right? So really, if you think of this in terms of, say, the building, the building is kind of moving uh, this way, actually. Okay, so through the magic of coding a separate animation over here, what I'm going to do, let's just plot one. Plot this. This is what I'm assuming is my initial position of the building. So it's kind of fixed here, set up there. And then what will happen is for uh, each value of time, I'm going to plot this uh, kind of shifting here. So at this unit of time, the building's kind of shifted a little bit, given by this blue, or sorry, given by this red curve overlined over the blue. So if I change this line width to be a bit smaller, what I can do is I can physically see what's happening with this building. So do, 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 do. if I clear out all the plots, if I tell this to plot, it pops up on this screen. And sorry about that. You'll see it in a second. So here's what's happening to the building. So you can see it's kind of bigger, oscillating bigger on one side, and now it's bigger on this side. And then over time, it kind of reaches its maximum here. And now it starts decreasing in the amplitude to the left-hand side, and the right-hand side amplitude starts increasing. So that's what that plot over there is really telling me, that if this distance is my y sub t, this is how the building's oscillating. And again, this is probably a bit more extreme. I could increase this. Uh, height of the building to make it slightly more realistic. But this is something we care about because we don't like it when buildings do this. And generally speaking, buildings will do this to one extent or another. Okay, so just one more time with the animation. And this time I made the building a bit taller and a bit wider. So here, this would be another, oh, come on, another example of the building here. So in this case, it's a bit more realistic. You have kind of smaller oscillations here. Uh, yeah, it's not changing the size just because I put too small of a pause here. But uh, yeah, so you, oh, there we go. So yeah, you can see kind of these slight little vibrations here and that's physically one example of what this problem is telling us. Okay, so if we go back to our friend this plot here, we get these nice little bounds here and there's this kind of envelope that you could put up here of these kind of sinusoidal, cosinusoidal modes sitting over the top. Okay, so now the next, and the important thing here is this remains bounded. Okay, so now the next thing, I could change these values. What if this frequency is really close to W? So if I do this, what do we think will happen? Well, just kind of pause it and think a little bit. Okay, 
hear you. Oops. There you go. Okay, so in this case, we have these kind of, this R bounding function fits really well. And if I zoom in here, you can tell that I do get pretty much dead on that uh, proposed maximum. But you can see from here, I don't really have kind of the big overarching things happening with this R function. Why? Well, R, the period of it, is this omega naught minus omega. Well, 2 pi divided by that. So here, this 100 times pi isn't big enough simply because to capture a single period, I need it to be this thing, which is roughly this term here versus the 100 times pi. That's, yeah, 340. It's not big enough. So if I rerun this with this kind of bigger setup here, this will actually plot a full period. And we can see we have these high frequency high being relatively speaking, but we have these high frequency vibrations in blue. This isn't actually filled in. Uh, and if I zoom in here, you can see the little oscillations. Uh, on each one of these periods, it roughly equals, it hits the upward bound for R over that period of the R function. And you can see up here, we basically reach the max and mins at these points. Okay, so basically what's happening here is as I get close, as this W naught gets further and further away from W in terms of uh, absolute value, if I assume both of them are positive, for instance, uh, as they get further away, these kind of get more and more out of sync. But as they get closer and closer, this uh, forcing term gets more and more in sync with the natural harmonics of the system. And I get closer and closer to this absolute maximum here and the absolute minimum down here. Okay, so your text actually has a example of this. So let's just finish this discussion here with a tweaking the things to get something that looks similar to the term in the book. Okay, so I kind of liked this one here. So basically what I did is I just made this 0.9. So here you can see that this red thing here is indeed an envelope for the solution. So if I actually take the absolute value of it and plot one with positive, one with negative, then I actually get an envelope on each side. So that's the term in the book that you saw there. So let me just do this real quick. Okay, so just plotting the bit down here, you see that this R does in fact bound th this curve, which is why we really wanted to drive the uh, expression in this form here, as opposed to this kind of clunkier form here. Because we don't know what the absolute bound, like what the bounding curve is there, but we do know what the bounding curve is when the functions of this form. And in general, this idea of the bounding curve for the envelope or the envelope of the vibrations is a robust idea. And you can generally speaking, always find something that's a bounding curve like this. Sometimes it can be mathematically hard to do though. Okay, so uh, in addition to this, within here, we have several oscillations. So in this case, we have 10 vibrations in each one of these if you count them. And it turns out that if you just think of that, uh, the number of vibrations that you would expect to get would be uh, W divided by W minus W naught. So if I put this in here, we do get 10, which corresponds to these oscillations here. Okay, so again, that's robust, at least for this case. So here we get these 10 vibrations where we kind of reach the max and then kind of tone back down. So here you can tell that we don't actually hit the maximum because if you just look in here, these oscillations here kind of both miss it. This one gets kind of close. Uh, and generally speaking, that's why if these numbers get closer and closer to each other, you're going to get closer and closer to actually obtaining the upper bound just because the oscillations in here will be more dense. So if I do one more example, if I have an odd number of these oscillations like I have in this picture, then you can tell that this middle one just by symmetry will kind of be in the middle and we will actually obtain this maximum value here or get very close to it. Uh, so if we wanted to actually do this, we could just count the number of oscillations in here and figure out what our uh, omega naught needed to be. So in general, the way that you would do this is to use the fact that the number of oscillations would simply be that omega, which we forced to be one, uh, divided by the absolute value of one minus omega. So here, uh, this term here, one divided by one minus whatever my omega naught is going to be. This is going to tell me the number of uh, modes that I have. If I want this to be an odd number, say nine, I could solve this for omega naught, 
and just doing that from here, I could simply see that omega naught, pull this over, uh, pull that term over here. So I would simply get one minus nine over nine, which I really want this to be positive. So I can, without loss of generality, take this term. Uh, and if I do this over here, so in particular, if I pick this thing here, that's how I generated this. So for instance, if I wanted to have five instead of nine, we can notice that we can do this thing here. Okay, so if I do this and run it, I get five bumps, one, two, three, four, five, and the, this guy here reaches the maximum. Okay, so that's just something that you can notice and it's not particularly something you have to do for every problem, but it really helps us to understand what's happening within the context of this model here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is put this problem here to rest. Uh, I have these two MATLAB files that I will include if you wanna play with it. You can if you want, it's up to you, but you don't have to, but it is kind of useful to analyze this case a little bit further and to just kind of get your hands dirty there. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to examine one more final case. So I'm going to remove this, and now we're going to examine the case. What if this assumption that I made up here where omega naught isn't equal to omega, what if that is no longer true? So in that case, our solution doesn't work, obviously, because we divide by zero here. So in this case, we need to, again, use the method of undetermined coefficients, and we're going to, instead of using this onzot up here, we're going to simply, there we go, uh, instead of using this onzot, we're going to simply uh, multiply this whole thing by x. So you know how to do this. So what I'm going to do is just simply uh, chase this out really quickly and then give you the solution. Okay, so let's give a TLDR review. Okay, so now that we have the solution, we can do the same analysis that we did before, and we can try to put a upper bound on this, okay? So here, an upper bound on y of t, or the absolute value of it, well, the sines and cosine terms will be bounded by c1 and c2, respectively. So if I really wanna put this together, I could bound this first by the absolute value of this thing here. So to be explicit, And now I can use the triangle inequality twice to split this up. So recall the triangle inequality just over here on the side. Uh, triangle inequality is that the absolute value of a plus b is strictly less than or equal to the absolute value of a plus the absolute value of b, okay? So this is a very important inequality and in general you should know this. It pops up all the time in applications like this. Okay, so if I do this and expand this out by using this twice, I get this term here. Okay, so now since sine and cosine are both bounded uh, by one, I can put an upper bound over this, that this term would be bounded by this, this term would be bounded by that term, and this term would be bounded by that, all in absolute value. Okay, so note this is valid for all uh, initial value problems since this is valid for all constants C1 and C2, and we know that this thing has a solution for any initial conditions of the form y of zero is constant and y prime of zero is constant. Okay, so what is this telling me? Well, these two terms, these are just constants. So nothing kind of fancy here happens and I just have a nice clean bound. But this, this term grows with t, right? So this thing I could write as for positive values of time. So just to put it there, just to be a bit cleaner for the people who will just read the notes. Uh, so from here, because of this, this is increasing with respect to time. This means if the frequency omega is exactly one of those, well, is exactly this uh, harmonic frequency omega naught, then 
the solution grows with time and bad things happen. So let's look at this visually. Okay, so jumping back to, back to MATLAB, here I define my terms. I just pick C1, C2 to be zero. You can pick them to be anything else. Change my Y, my upper bound, all that good stuff. So here, if I plot this, you can see that my upper bounds were given by these terms here. I actually realize my upper bounds in the case where the coefficients are zero, at least. Uh, and the reason why I'm actually realizing these bounds is purely because if I go back to look at this sine term here, this uh, solution that I have is just this sine of omega t times this thing, right? So I'm always going to realize the upper bound at some point because the upper bound is just basically given by this. And whenever uh, sine of omega t is equal to one, I'm going to actually have the upper bound. And same thing for the lower bound where sine of omega t is equal to minus one. I'll see the lower bound. Uh, so anyways, yeah, so in this case, we have these little growing uh, oscillations here, which can be a bad thing. Let's look at the building, for example. So if I run this code, here's my building. So it's not bad. Oh, it's really starting to oscillate. It's oscillating off the grid size here. So let's get rid of this extra condition here so we can actually see it grow. So here, again, it starts small. It gets bigger and bigger and I'll just run, let it run for a few seconds until we get sufficiently big. Yeah, so you can see this building eventually isn't going to be able to withstand this, right? Because if I keep having that forcing term sitting here, these oscillations are going to grow unbounded with time, and eventually the building materials won't be able to hold that together. So this is what's called the idea of resonance, okay? So since the forcing term is pushing at the exact uh, frequency omega naught here for this problem, it so happens that basically every time uh, we go through one of these cycles of the forcing term, it's kind of pushing with the swing. So if we use the swing analogy here and uh, write this guy out here, if you're pushing your friend on the swing, whenever they're reaching here, you're pushing this way, and whenever they're over here, you're pushing this way, What's going to happen is each oscillation that you're just going to get larger and larger amounts of energy going into the system, and eventually they're going to wee you until things break within the model or the physical swing breaks or something like that. Okay, so just adding a little bit of text here. In this case, we say that the forcing terms resonates or resonate with the spring mass system. Examples, if we look at the swing, again, if you always push in the direction of motion, then you will always keep going higher, and this will be kind of unbounded until either your first forcing term isn't matching fully, which in practice, that's what you kind of see there, or the dampening, because recall, this is with no dampening, right? I don't have a dampening term, or dampening effects kick in. Another example that you can think of is bridges. And for an example of this happening with the bridge, in this case, the wind is blowing from one side or another, and it's actually blowing at a resonant frequency of the bridge. Bridges can be modeled by the linear wave equation, which we've seen before, and we've seen the uh, eigenvalues of that, which correspond with the harmonics of that. So from there, if the wind is blowing at one of those eigenfrequencies, one of the natural frequencies, you get this happening. So what's happening is over time, this is slowly bending more and more because the dampening wasn't sufficient to actually stop the motion from growing in this case. And here the bridge eventually collapses. So I'm going to uh, cite this uh, link here within the page itself. So you can go check that out if you want. And you can even talk about this type of stuff happening with different cases, right? Uh, for instance, the classical thing where you have a wine glass and you sing at the right tone. So just stealing from here, here, uh, these guys, the slow-mo guys, have this nice little system here where this is vibrating at one of the resonant frequencies. This is filled full of water. You can see as it vibrates, you get these spurts of water coming out. And this is corresponding to the modes within the glass growing. Now, if I go to this other bit, oops, a little too far. Now, if I go to this other bit, where it's empty, you can see the glass bending back and forth. And what happens is once you put enough energy in via this forcing tone or forcing frequency that matches one of the resonant frequencies of the glass, it will eventually shatter, okay? So now just as a final comment on applications here,
or actually uh, or actually here you can see it vibrate a bit more before it shatters uh, but as a final comment here in general in the real world the forcing terms that you are given won't be exactly one of these cosine type terms but generally speaking they will be decomposable into a sum of lots of these cosine type terms for various values of omega so if I go back up here in the real world you'll have a sum of a bunch of these forcing terms and given a kind of arbitrary forcing function at least some of that forcing function will be at a frequency of omega naught so in the real world you really need to worry about uh, having sufficient dampening because if you're not damped then you get this uh, linear increase in the the uh, amplitude and given kind of an arbitrary wind there will be some component of say that wind or any type of forcing term that you could possibly imagine that will be at one of these fundamental frequencies so Dampening is important, and that's why we're going to now look at dampening. So to end very quickly, free di vibrations with dampening. So this is the case where we don't have any forcing terms, but we do have that the F is zero. I mean, we do have that the C is non-zero. So here we have C is not equal to zero, but F is equal to zero. So in this case, our equations of motion would simply be m double prime plus uh, c y prime plus my k y is equal to zero where here we really want the c to be greater than zero so in this case if you go to solve this you build up your characteristic equation and you can find your roots and just stealing from the text to speed this up so you don't have to sit through it the roots of the characteristic equation for this thing will simply be these two quadratic terms so what we're going to do in the next lecture is examine the three possible cases here. Case one, where this term over here, this c squared minus 4mk is, say, equal to zero, the case where this thing is greater than zero, and the case where this thing is less than zero. And in each case, we'll find different possibilities for how the modes will work based on how damped the system is okay and the goal of this in practical terms is given some system we probably want it to be dampened so that we don't get this exponential growth so we don't get swings exploding bridges falling down wine glasses shattering all of that good stuff okay so i'll leave it here for this lecture and again in the next lecture this is what we're going to focus on